Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Jamy. I'm a researcher at CNRS, and I'm also the chair of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science, which is the committee that is organizing the present event. Um, this morning's webinar is our uh, CGES's contribution to the Global Women's Breakfast. The Global Women's Breakfast is an initiative um, of the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry that started uh, more than a decade ago. And last year it started going interdisciplinary, which means that um, women around the world and in all um, scientific disciplines get together for breakfast and some uh, activity. And our activity today, we have had the breakfast and then those of us who are physically present had a tour of the new uh, Maison des Mathématiques, the House of Mathematics in Paris, which is a new mathematical museum that was conceived amongst other things with uh, great attention to uh, showing ma the, the mathematics as a discipline uh, practiced by both men and women on equal terms. So that it means for people who view the exhibition, they know that math is for them, whatever their gender. So we started with this and now we are going to uh, have a um, webinar that will discuss how one can uh, popularize science in a way that uh, is gender balanced and, and tells the, uh, uh, the viewers or the audience that science is for you, whatever your gender. So, um, and I, I should um, also explain that the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science uh, results from uh, 24th International Scientific Union getting together to work on gender equality across scientific disciplines. So uh, we have existed for four years and we have done a number of webinars and we are particularly uh, happy this morning that we are doing this session uh, across disciplines to, um, to uh, take part in the Global Women's Breakfast. Thank you. Okay, so we we are uh, just uh, starting with this session, which is uh, as Catherine said, uh, popular popularizing. Uh, okay, uh, the name of the webinar. Okay. Popularizing science without uh, gender bias. And uh, you can see, so we, we are here a few people in, uh, inside this uh, amphitheater in Paris, but we have also, like, we are about maybe 30 people here, but we have also uh, a number of people attend this to register to the, to the webinar. And you can see the, the geographical distribution. It's no wonder that there are more people in Europe because the event is in Paris, and so several people of, of you are in fact part of the city. Okay, so uh, we look also at the gender distribution. So it's more or less always the same in all our webinars that the gender distribution that we have around 80 percent uh, 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 female and 20 percent male. And now the uh, Topic distribution, and again, it's no surprise that today it's a lot of mathematicians because uh, the topic of the of the first lecture, and there are also a few people uh, from education, biology, and so some people uh, which are uh, working for museums. So that's uh, what we have today, and also as usual, there is really uh, a lot of people from various parts, from various. Uh, moments in their careers, which are part of the, of the webinar. We have undergraduate students, we have PhD students, we have postdocs, and so on and so on. Also, emerita professor like me. And so it means that the interest for gender equality in science is really uh, existing in all uh, uh, possible states of career and also in secondary and tertiary education. So that's what we want to say about the webinar. And now I'm going to give the floor to Clotilde. Thank you for your interest, you guys. You showed to the, the option to the museum. So um, yes, we, will, we wanted to talk with Sylvie Benzoni. We prepared the talks, the, the slides together. 
about a mathematical museum in the light of general gap issues. So maybe first slide, how it started. So the point is that it started a couple of years ago. Christoph knows that. Because I think we start from 2000. You're not on camera. On camera. Like this? Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, it looks okay now. Okay, so 2017, uh, the Institut Henri Poincaré uh, board was, uh, you see, many men, so very nice colleagues. The director, Cédric Villani and Jean-Philippe Uzan, the scientific ad advisory board, uh, Olivier Schiffman and Cédric Piolin. The board of directors was, uh, 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 was um, managed by by uh, Mr. Benichou and uh, the Outreach Advisory Board by Olivier Drouet. Okay, so we had a very good team, very, very efficient, only men. And as you can see, uh, the gender equality was not really, not really, uh, not really, was an issue. If you look to the population of members of the different boards, the scientific board maybe is more caricature in some sense. The outreach advisory board was also a little bit disbalanced, you know, and in some sense for outreach issues, it's, uh, it can look very strange, but the, the fact was that was, there were positions in this board which were institutional positions, and so the, the head of the French Mathematical Society, for example, was a man at that moment. Okay. And uh, the board of directors may look better, but if you think that uh, there are a lot of persons in this board which are staff from the Institution Yves Poincaré, and that this staff was a woman. In fact, the women who were in this community were more or less people from the staff and not people uh, from the staff. Uh, ah, Comment? C'est pas vrai? Quoi, c'est pas vrai? Oui, il y avait. You can look. There were 10 women and 20 men. Yeah. 10 women, but the 10 women, uh, there was uh, people who were also from the staff of the Institute in Poincaré. Yes, you were in the scientific. Uh, but for example, when I was meeting you at this board, it was because I was replacing the guy sorry. up there. <laughs> and the man who should have been there was Christophe. Yeah. Sorry. People in your room, you should talk, you should not go through. So you don't do that. I mean, you don't interrupt Clotilde. Oh, I can repeat the question. I can repeat the question. No, si vous ne pas passer, je vais Okay. No, but if I. You will not be broadcasted. So the way to broadcast is to sit there. And, and then when there will be questions from the room, I have to re okay. repeat them because otherwise it doesn't get through. I mean, so thank you. my point is not to criticize. I mean, I, I, I am very fond of these colleagues and they have done a great job. Okay. It's just the fact. The fact was that the gender equality was an issue at that time, I think. Um, maybe how is it now? Oh, you see that it has changed. Okay, and what has changed is that in 2017, uh, when Cédric Villani decided to do politics, we had to find another. I mean, at that time, I was deputy director in the Mathematical Institute in the CNRS with Christophe, who was uh, the head. And uh, the point was that we, we had to find a new uh, new uh, head for the Institute Henri Poincaré and Sylvie Benzoni came. And now what you can see is that there is some sort of gender balance. Here again, it's just a fact. Okay? And even though the new board of director is a man, we will have perfect equality gender in this in this world. Okay. So now we will see Vivendoni, Dominique Moana, who is a physicist, who is the, the, the deputy director of the institute. And the scientific advisory board is managed by Benoît Dusso, a physicist, and Eleonora Dinezza, a mathematician. And I am in charge of the outreach advisory board. And now you see that the outreach is very poor. It's, it's a sort of balance has changed. So um, just to have a look, to the, um, it's interesting to have a glimpse of the initial museum project. So these pictures are taken from the original, uh, the first pictures, the first pictures for presenting uh, the, the program of the museum. And, you have to think that at that time, it was 2017, it was uh, the competition for, for getting to, for being the architect of the project. So it was the kind of picture that was inside the, the proposal of the architect to get, to get the, to get the, to get the, 
to the museum. And in fact, what is had at that time, it was some history of the museum. So uh, saying about uh, Bo uh, Poincaré, who is there, Borel, and Borel was, was the head, was created with this, uh, this institute here. Jean Perrin, that we have talked about uh, before, okay, was uh, uh, the, the head of the building where you now is the museum. So in fact, starting from what they knew about the museum, this, this architect and the scenographer, which was, uh, which was working with him, they have provided these this drawings of what could be the museum. And in some sense, it is representing what people think, I mean, usual people in the street think about a mathematical museum. So this is the hall, the entrance of the museum. So we have these uh, prominent male figures. And then the office of uh, Jean Perrin, with, uh, which was thought that would be devoted to Jean, to Jean Perrin and his action, so with pictures of him. Then you have the amphitheater. It was already more or less uh, thought as a place where we will talk about history. And so you see Euler, and over, I think there is Newton somewhere, maybe it's here. Okay, the idea was to, to show prominent mathematicians. And here you see we have uh, something, a um, uh, film. I don't remember the name of this thing with a guy who is doing mathematics from, uh, from um, he's just cleaning in the MIT and he's doing mathematics on the board. So this idea of the genius, uh, the genius in mathematics, which come, which arrive and do uh, things. Uh, okay. So some sort of image of um, the fact that mathematics are something like a gift and that you have it or you don't have it. Then the Grand Gallery, uh, um, for those who have been in a visit, it's not exactly like that, but it is now. And you see that very few things were actually, uh, were, 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 there is no really science or just title, but also because this, the, the thinking about how, what, about the content of the museum was not yet, uh, not yet done. In the uh, upper of the tea room for sharing, um, I mean, it was, yeah, it was a sharing place. So you see uh, uh, people who are represented. And then the other space of the building, the space for research, when we see a majority of men, men figuring it. Okay. So I think it's interesting to look to these old, uh, old images because they show how people, I mean, the scenographer is not a mathematician, he's not a scientist, but I think he represents very well the way think, educated persons think to mathematics. Something for men, you know, something a little dull because this is not very nice, <laughs> and something from the past, you know, big, big pictures in uh, white and black. So, um, so what happens after? Uh, how it's uh, going uh, now? Yeah. And uh, the, the real museum, the one where we have been just a moment before. So now the entrance hall, uh, every picture of this, uh, this old man has disappeared. Okay, it's, uh, and, and uh, you have seen there is uh, some, um, some, uh, let me just after, some, um, what's the name? Uh, yes, optic, optic theater, we're presenting mathematical tools in a funny way. It has been done by uh, Pierre Sorin, who is uh, I was on a lot of this optic theater, and was, uh, we have been very lucky. That he was interested in helping us. Huh? And then the experience office, where we have really, I think, yeah, it's here, experience office, the Devenir place, where we have very insisted in the to have Jean Perrin and Yvette Couchois. I mean, Yvette Couchois was the head of the lab. After Jean Perrin, she was a and, and we had, I remember, very complicated issues about the fact that the picture, you see the picture is shorter, and it was not so clear that uh, for the scenography, that it would be good to have the same at the same level, but we really wanted to have these both pictures, tutorial pictures, because it, it's a chance, in fact, we had a man and we had a woman just after, and to use this, uh, this specificity of the physical chemist lab, uh, to, to, to advertise, uh, yeah, they were, they are both here. And uh, you see, so, some, uh, so we have decided not to center this space uh, around the personality of Jean Perrin, even though it's very interesting. Um, we have published some, some little booklets for, about Jean Perrin for people who are interested in. 
but we have uh, we have prepared to have various portraits of people and um, we have insisted again to have color portraits because it was not so clear in so for the scenography and to have color portraits of people or various people with various colors of course and just to, to to show that in fact mathematics are present in very different spaces place areas of uh, of life uh, so the influence all we have seen in parents of peace uh, where I've been uh, okay and then the amphitheater which is uh, with uh, this, uh, we didn't discuss this before, but there is some blackboard, false blackboard where people are, are writing. And um, this was a nice moment for preparation because we made a, we asked people to propose their hands, you know, to, we wrote to mathematicians asking them if uh, from some casting about hands. And so we, we got some answers. And we had four hands which came for writing the mathematics. Hands. So here the amphitheater uh, with these four figures. So we don't see Amy Notter, who is there. Okay, so two women, Maria Mirza Academy and Amy Notter, and then Turing and Ramanujan as some tutelaire figure uh, in, the, in, the, in the lecture room. Um, yeah, and in this amphitheater, for those who are not there, there is here are some. Here is the day of the, of the inauguration, they see the Benzoni here. And uh, on this screen, when you visit if you, uh, the amphitheater, you see eight portraits of uh, these uh, colleagues who are presenting or talking about the way they do mathematics, about how they came to mathematics, or what they like in mathematics, how they invent new mathematics. And as you can see, you, it's uh, for men and for women. This was important for us. But it's also person who have not studied in France. We okay. were thought that it was interesting for for the for, for the young people who are, who are going to come here to see that mathematics are done all over the world and that they are done by people who don't have the same background than them and because they have studied abroad. And we have we have tried for the French one. Uh, we have tried to have someone who is not coming through uh, an école normal. Uh, it was important for us to show that people from university, uh, studying in university, can also do mathematics as a as a job after. Um, okay, what I wanted to say also is that yes, we tried to have people which were not from from European descent just to, to help our students to our students the, the people the, the pupils from secondary school to well mostly just to, to, to show them non unified picture. Um, so the grand gallery that's maybe for those who have been there you have the image. So okay, it's nice. We try to, to have something bright and to think to the content in terms of um, okay, yeah, maybe it's not really visible, but the, the main idea what when during the elaboration of the exhibition, the first thing was to think to whom you were thinking, to whom we were, we wanted to talk. And uh, what we have decided on what was I think maybe very helpful was to think to someone who is at the end of the college. So someone around 13, 14 years old. Uh, so it means that he has some kind of mathematic background, which is more or less the one of everybody in, uh, in France. Okay, so from the beginning of secondary school uh, level in mathematics. Huh? Um, so that was our public. And then we had to, to, to decide of what we are going to think. And at the very beginning, that was something very complicated because okay, I was working in the, in the amphitheater, so with this invention, so this historical background, and where we try to, to advertise main figures, and suddenly there is only old men, so we try to think how many percentage, or so 20% is it enough, 30 would be better, 40. So we had this sort of discussions uh, which were never stopping, and at some point, uh, it was C.B. Mandoni, we decided to say, okay, 50%. So, and this was really a relief. So at the beginning, I was thinking 50%, yes, but we are not 50% uh, of women. And, she, and the point is that since we are choosing, we cannot, we, we, it was clear that we will not be able to talk about all the mathematics that exist because we have to choose some topics. So if we decide to choose, 
we can choose to talk of as many men as many women. And the idea was that this will create an atmosphere in which the young people coming could, could, uh, could feel related with some figures or the other ones just because the, the figures would be diverse. So uh, what happened in between? So I have already told you a part of the story. Uh, so the point is that this, uh, this museum has been designed by a female team. Okay. So I used to say to my, to my children that today I'm going to, to visit Les Dames de l'IHP, so the ladies of the Institut Henri Poincaré, because actually it was the first time for me that I was working only with women. So here yeah, is uh, Sylvie Manzoni, the head of the Institute, uh, Marion Lévy, who was uh, in charge of the project, so sort of manager of the Maison Poincaré, and she, she, she was with us with the first part of the project, and then it was Elodie Christophe who took, uh, took over the, the job. And here is Céline Nadal, who has been something, someone very important for us because she's a museographer. So she was the one. The exhibition was uh, thought and designed by, by a group of scientists, but after that, you have to, to address the general audience. And on that respect, it was Céline who was rewriting our text, or cutting, and because we were too long, and leaving some, some, some very, very important. Uh, directives for doing something which was uh, good for, for people. And the point is that uh, Sylvie and Céline has written, have written an article that you can find on the Guide pour un musée féministe, so Guide for a Feminist Museum, so where they explain uh, the principles that have guided them during this, uh, this the elaboration of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the exhibition. So I am here as the head of um, the um, Committee for Mathematical Culture, and I am also here as a scientific advisor, because uh, actually the team was not completely women, but was two men. So Antoine Chamberlois, who was a uh, scientific, scientific advisor, as I mean, CB, we were the three mathematicians in the team, Sylvie, me, and Antoine. And uh, Rémi Dumas, who was the scenographer, so the one who was put in light, uh, in fact, uh, what we have thought. Yeah. So the design of, uh, of the, the furniture, things like that. And uh, I think he has really thought uh, to, to I mean, the choosing with uh, this sort of graphism that you find also in the museum. That was uh, his, his job. Uh, so, the museum is ready, opening campaign. At that moment, uh, we had an issue about uh, uh, the media. I mean, for us, it was not so clear how to address the media. In some sense, uh, uh, that would be reasonable to think to, to, to Sylvie Benzoni who was in charge of the, of the full exhibition, and Cédric Villani was the one who has started to, to promote the, the, the museum. And so uh, the idea of uh, the institute has been to, to gather a, a team of ambassadors, which were all mathematicians. Some of them were involved into the, into the preparation of the exhibition. For example, uh, Sylvain Faure was the one who has created the, the game with uh, the movements of with the ships, the movement uh, that you have to, to bring in their, in their area, so about France movements. Uh, Luca Girin is the one who has created the, the device with, um, with uh, the data, you know, he's our data scientist. Uh, here is uh, here it's, uh, a colleague who has developed some soliton, which is not yet here, and there are also uh, this, co this colleague who has developed the um, uh, thing about imaging processing. So. It was a team of people who have worked on uh, the devices and also people who are mathematicians who are friends of the Institute of like Nathalie, who is here, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and wanted to promote uh, a certain vision of mathematics, the mathematics for everybody. It was the claim of Sylvie Benzoni. We want to show in the museum mathematics for everybody. So this was uh, the team of the ambassadors. And uh, the point is that it was a good idea to be a big team because we have a lot of we got a lot of solicitations by the by the media. Uh, that was really surprising that this idea of a museum of mathematics 
was uh, okay, has raised interest in the media. So lots of articles, lot of um, we we went to the TV, TV the TV here. Uh, there was some broadcast also on uh, on the radio, even radio classic. You see here. Yeah. So yeah, really a big success. And uh, yeah, our favorite ones are this article in Le Monde and uh, this radio broadcast in France Culture. I think. We, are, we have elected our favorite ones because we have, we have a lot of, we can choose which one are the one we prefer. And uh, maybe it was due to, to a big campaign in the in YouTube. The actually, with these uh, huge advertising pictures, which were uh, in the corridors in the tube. Um, I mean, it was really, really, uh, it was really emotional to see them in the tubes. Wow, the Maison Poincaré is in the tubes. Um. And the point is that it has, it has really, really worked very well. And um, for example, the first Saturday, uh, there was people were queuing in the, in the street because you could not, you, for entering the museum, you need that enough people has left. And so there was some queuing process in the museum, in the street, that was really amazing. I mean, because in some sense, uh, we had worked a lot with, uh, with, uh, with professors in secondary schools, and we knew that math teacher would be interested to bring their, their, their pupils somewhere. So that was clear that that would work. But, the general audience, we were not really aware of how many people would be interested, and we decided to open on Saturday so that the general audience could come. But for at some point, it was to see, you know, and it seems that it works. So the fact is also that there are some some as soon as there is a proposition, with uh, you can have vis organize visits in the museum, and there is also some sort of workshop. So on Saturday, so there are activities that is motivating also people to come, but uh, in the interest for mathematics has to be there. And this is uh, really, really, really nice to see. Okay, so this is my last, last, last slide, and I think I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for inviting me uh, to, to talk today. I'm very uh, honored. Uh, to, to reach a new audience, <laughs> so uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm an astrophysicist, uh, and uh, I wrote a book that uh, I brought here to, to show you. I wrote a book, it's in French, so I'm very sorry. <laughs> I mean, have a, a lot of examples of French things in this talk, and uh, so I, I will uh, speak, of course, in English. But uh, I think some of the issues I'm going to mention are very French specific, but maybe it's also true in other languages. So that's why I, I still, uh, I'm still happy to, to talk to you. So the, the talk is entitled uh, Writing an Inclusive Pop Science Astronomy Book in French in 2022. <coughs> question I asked myself and some answers I found, and I don't think I had all the answers, so I'm very happy to share also with you uh, your experience and your knowledge. And, uh, if you have any comments and advice, I'm very open for, for every everything. So first, I wanted to, to introduce myself uh, and also to explain how, how I came up with the, the book. So um, I graduated uh, from Sorbonne University, so just across the, the street, um, in Bachelor Engineering, uh, sorry, in Mechanical Engineering in 2013. And just before that, I had done a, a super internship uh, summer research project at the University of Oxford, where, as I will tell you later, I, I found some ideas for my future career. And during my studies, I was a member of uh, an association an NGO, you say, association, uh, which is called uh, Wax Science. So now it's kind of closed because after the COVID, we had a lot of difficulties to maintain the, the, the community. But I don't know if some of you know about Wax, it was uh, very, very active in the years 2010, 20, uh, so until the COVID. And the idea of Wax, it was uh, an association created by uh, students and very early career researchers to promote science without stereotypes. And it was not only gender stereotypes, it was 
also the stereotypes that science is dull, as we <laughs> saw earlier, and difficult, and only for a very specific uh, category of people. So with this association, I uh, learned a lot, especially because we worked a lot with uh, scientists, but also with people from outreach, communication, graphism, graphism sorry for my English, I'm not super good to speak, not of astronomy in English, but um, so it was very good experience because I learned a lot about uh, sharing, uh, having new ideas with a group of people and also uh, not only with pure scientists because in science, we are very good in math and physics, but sometimes we are not good at communicating. And so I, I learned a lot uh, in this group. Then I did a, an internship at the European Space Agency uh, on the surface of Mercury. Then I did a PhD project at the Observatory of Paris. Uh, and during this project, so I was working on numerical simulations of the interaction of the solar wind with three planets. Mercury, Saturn, and Uranus, but uh, I was working specifically on a, a mission that is called Bepi Colombo. So it's a mission from the a space mission from the European Space Agency. And it was launched just after my PhD uh, defense. And during the PhD, I worked with uh, one of my uh, former uh, teachers, Alain Gilles Sundira, to create a, and to use the occasion that a lot of scientists would go to the French Guiana for the launch of the mission to organize a big project so that we would go to a lot of schools uh, and uh, with a lot of people from, from, from jobs, so engineers, technicians, uh, administrative people. So we, we went to classes. I also created a, a board game to present the mission and we went to the market and we went to, so it was a very huge, huge project and it was followed by uh, another one. I was not part of this one, but for the launch of JUICE, another European mission. So it's a, it was a very uh, nice experience also. Then I was in Mossoc in Toulouse, and then I joined Femme Science. I think it's because I was in a team with only two female permanent researchers, and one of them invited me to a, a breakfast of Femme Science. So I think it was a, a need also at that time to actually meet female colleagues. So I was very happy there. I, uh, I met a, a very active community of uh, Femme Science. And, uh, Parallel to the activities I did with Family Science, I uh, created another board game on another European space mission called Solar Orbiter. And this one uh, was then edited by the French space agency, CNES. Uh, so in this board game, I had already uh, put some ideas of how I, I think, it, not me really, but how we think it's nice to promote science. Um, and then I got a permanent position at uh, Sorbonne University, uh, and I'm doing a lot of things on space missions because that's uh, what I love uh, the most. So I'm very busy, and at spring 2022, I also discovered I was pregnant. So I really love this uh, artist, I don't know if you know Emma, uh, she's a French uh, artist and she did a big book on women to load of women. I strongly recommend men and women to read this uh, guide. And um, so just to say, I was very, very busy, a uh, lot of things, and I got an email asking me if I wanted to write a book. First, I thought it was a spam, so I deleted it. <laughs> but then the guy actually asked me again, Sylvain Colette, and they uh, found my editors. And then I realized it was not a, a, a spam or a joke, and uh, we discussed together, and I was like, but, you know, I'm very busy. Why should I write now a pop science book? So I don't know if you all know what pop science is. It's a style of writing. It's very common in the United States. And it's about writing science books, but with no equations. Uh, it's something you should read like a novel. So there are very few sketches, but it's not like an encyclopedia or a course book. Um, and it's about speaking of, of course, very accurate things. It's not uh, easy. But uh, you should write at the first person, saying I uh, did that and blah, blah, and make science more uh, personal and uh, including a lot of uh, uh, references to culture or personal experience and stuff like that. So it's uh, very common in the United States, but not so much in France. So I thought, of course, I want to speak about planets and space missions, but one of my other big uh, issues, uh, as a lot of you here, 
it's like there is an issue when I talk to kids in schools, I show that, say that's the world population today, two women, two men. And that's the French population of permanent researchers of astrophysics in 2022. Or 2025, the number is not changing very much. And it's good because a century ago it was uh, <laughs> only men, so it's still a big progress. But kids, they are very good at understanding with only these two slides that there's an issue. So, also something that I'm very uh, stressed about, and it's not only for um, girls, it's uh, these numbers. I don't know if you know the tool of, of OCDE, uh, or that. it's very easy because you have a lot of numbers and you can extract data very quickly from your country. and. Uh, from a lot of studies. So it's the number, the percentage of 15 year old teenagers who don't pass a basic skill test in reading, so it's the first line, in maths, and from only the last 10 years, they also do the study in science. So that's why you don't have the number for, oops, it's not, uh... ah, ça a pas passé la slide. Sorry, I don't, it falls here. Parce que du coup, vous ne comprenez pas de quoi je parle. Ça n'a pas changé. Ah oui, ça n'a pas changé. Ouais. <rire> c'est le zoom qui est. Je pense que c'est le zoom qui Il est tombé. So it's actually the numbers of people who don't pass the test. And what is nice is to see that men and women are equally bad. <rire> and even in the reading, girls are better, but they are less bad. <rire> and in science, in maths, What is fun to see is that in maths, uh, girls are supposed to be less bad than boys, but now it's changing. So that's, that's a new problem. But the, the issue of these numbers is that everyone, boys and girls, they all are more and more bad <laughs> in maths and in science. So that was also uh, why I thought it would be nice to write the book. I thought it would be uh, my uh, small uh, contribution to uh, to try to make uh, science more accessible. It's very uh, confusing not to have my slides anymore. Uh, if you compare, so I did it simple. Blue is boys, pink is girls. I'm sorry for that, but just uh, easier to think about this because we are all uh, gender biased. <laughs> so uh, if you look at the numbers, um, so as I said, there are no numbers in science for 20, uh, 2003 because they didn't make the, the research uh, for science at that time. But when you look at these numbers, uh, you see that, uh, yeah, they say the young people, they are more and more uh, failing the test of basic skills. And uh, yes, except for the math test, but the science test, the men fail more than the women at 15 years old. But here it was not a question of gender, it was really just a number of Time and the fact that we need to promote culture and scientific culture a bit more. And also, I wanted to show you this, uh, this slide. So sorry, it's in French, but it was a study. Collègue, 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 by uh, the Association of Family Sciences about uh, the impact of. In France, we have uh, high school internships. So at 14 years old, 15 years old, the students, they can spend a week or two weeks in a company to learn how it is to work. And the study is about the impact of these uh, high school internships on uh, actually promoting scientific jobs to women. And the study is uh, completely available on the website and has a lot of information. But just these diagrams, they show you that uh, for boys, When you ask them to qualify science, they, the first adjective that comes is use, useful. And when you do the same test with girls of 15 years old, the first, so useful is coming next, <laughs> but the first word is difficult. So having this in mind, 
Uh, I did a lot of things and I participated in meetings like this one. Uh, so I, I kind of thought of why girls don't stay in STEM. It's not only me, I'm of course, who's doing that. But uh, so there, there is what we call the stereotype threat. So I hope you all know the, <laughs> what it is about. But it's the fact that, for example, if people say women can drive, when I passed the charging lesson, I was maybe more stressed <laughs> just because I'm a woman and I know that people think women uh, don't drive uh, well. So I uh, kind of uh, integrate the stereotype and then it affects my, uh, my actions. So that's the stereotype threat. Then you have, of course, gender biased parents, like teachers, like friends, society, blah, 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 blah. Plus lack of role models. And this, is still true today, so I like this picture. I took it in Dublin just in March 2022, and I was just about to go to a French uh, high school to promote women in science, and I just got the Disney, uh, so I hope I won't be sued by Disney for saying this here today. Um, but it's very fun, because in the US, so Disney, they are like attacked for being too woke and too uh, promoting too much women, but in Dublin, I found this, and. So I don't know what you think about that, but think about going to a CNRS competition to get a permanent position. <laughs> <laughs> of course, being loyal and spirited is absolutely the, the two uh, skills you, you will need. And of course, you're on the side. <laughs> and of course, you look like nice and smiling. And who is in the center and who is fearless and strong. But anyway. So just to say it's still true, we still have a lot of fights to do. And some, I put some, of course, because it's much more complicated than that, but some reasons why women don't stay in STEM, because that's the true, we also mentioned it at the last uh, Family Science uh, Colloque, is that now, of course, we have an issue to, 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 to bring young girls to science, but there is also an issue since the hashtag into uh, uh, movement to keep <laughs> uh, permanent female, female, permanent researchers in research. So, of course, we still have the stereotype threat, the imposter syndrome is uh, added to the list, uh, gender-based uh, teaching of science, because, uh, of course, there are less uh, female uh, teachers than male teachers at university, of course, the sexist work environment, but that's also true for other jobs, it's not specific to, to science, and still a lack of role models, so that was also uh, something I wanted to, to put in the book. And then I thought of what made me like astrophysics when I was a, a teenager. So first is my family, they are not scientists at all, but they brought me to study science, to uh, Salon du Bourget to see uh, the model of Ariane, uh, the rocket, um, to Palais de la Découverte. Uh, some of my high school teachers, and especially a, a female uh, high school teacher uh, who I still uh, talk to a lot, and she, she she took the group to the Olympiade de Physique. So it's a French competition for high school students where you have to, to show an experimental setup. Um, of course, conferences, exhibitions, discussions with role model, and I put men and women because it was very important to have both uh, for me. And uh, of course, all the association of admissions back uh, when I was a student uh, and others at Bouge, I didn't put them all, but they were very active. And also books, and I wrote, especially as a teenager, because then I had time to read. Um, and I, when I prepared this talk, I thought of the books I remember uh, when I was a teenager or early, uh, like, bachelor student. So, sorry, it's in French, but I, I didn't read a lot of English when I was a teenager. Um, I was a huge fan of Jean-Pierre Mignet's books because it was a history of science books and novels. So it was the life of Johannes Kepler, but written as a novel. And it was very, uh, you, you felt like you were a friend of uh, Johannes Kepler. Of course, all the Uber Reeves, I don't know if you all know Uber Reeves, but he died recently. So uh, he's a French speaking uh, astrophysicist and he wrote a lot of books. And um, of course, the book about Madame Curie. A book, uh, so not fun at all, about the solar system, but written by Thérèse Antronès, and uh, she was then a, a teacher and a colleague, so it helped me a lot. And also books that 
when I read about them now, I feel like it was uh, really a gender stereotypes, for example, the, the right stuff. In English, it's called the right stuff, <laughs> which is totally gender neutral. In French, it's called l'étoffe des héros. So uh, I don't know if you are very good in French, but you know, it's not heroine, it's hero. And uh, like, it didn't prevent me to go to a source. And then another one is the books from uh, Stephen Hawking, that you certainly know. Uh, it's called Sur les épaules des géants. So the giants, but the masculine version of giants. And if you see the cover, it's like, uh, of course, a very brilliant astrophysicist, but only men and in white, black and white. And then uh, I discovered also a book when I was young that's called The uh, Astronaut's Guide to Light on Earth by Chris Hatfield. He's an astronaut, an American astronaut. But it's the first book I read where, as, a, as I said in Pops and Books, the, the, the author was really talking about his personal life and giving very specific examples of why his training as an astronaut was useful in real life. And this is something I kept in mind that I missed in some of our science books, is why research on planets is actually useful for people, because it is uh, at some point. So, and then when I was a, a young professional, I read uh, other books, so then in English, I was more fluent in English. Um, and I took just a few of them to give you the main idea that I liked in those books. So if you wrote a book and it's not there, please uh, forgive me. It's, uh, I would be very interested to read uh, the books, but we have no idea. I don't know if you know about it. It's uh, very brilliant books about all the things we don't know in physics. And it was written in 2019 or something. It's very well illustrated. But I really like the idea that if you want to attract students, you should explain them that Jonas Kepler found that planets are turning around the sun three centuries ago. They don't feel like, okay, me, I really want to find why planets go around the sun like Kepler did because it was done 300 or 400 years ago. So this book is very nice because it gives you a perspective of all the things that still need to be discovered. Uh, then I, I really liked the cartoon, the comic books uh, Dans la Conduit de Thomas Pesquet because what I liked in this book is that it makes friends of scientists, really. Like the scene where Thomas Pesquet, he has to learn how to pin in the bathroom. It's like, or when they don't how, know how to fix the PowerPoint for the astronaut training, it's very fun. And I really like the fact that we scientists, we, we should be careful not to take ourselves too seriously. So that's why it's here. Then I read, I read the book because I so had seen the movie first, of course, but uh, Hidden Figures, and there I, I liked it because it's explaining very, uh, very uh, specific uh, uh, issues that women had to, to face uh, and how they actually uh, managed to, to face them. And the last book, it was a, so it was a book sent by me by the editor, Quanto, because it's uh, Quanto, uh, my publisher, it's uh, the French version of this book by Cathy Mack, The End of Everything. So Cathy Mack, she's a very uh, famous astrophysicist in the United States because she promotes, uh, she's a very good uh, science communicator, I would say. And she wrote a book about uh, different cosmology uh, theories about how the universe is supposed to end. And I really like this book when I read it because it's very uh, explained in a, I, I don't like to say simple way because it makes people think that women, they only like simple stuff like, uh, but it was really phrased in a very uh, readable way, you see? I had a lot of cosmology class with a lot of figures, a lot of numbers, but sometimes it's nice to have actually words, sentences, uh, with verbs, active verbs and stuff. So I really like this book. And uh, so it was translated into French by, uh, by Canto. And uh, Canto asked me to, to write such a book, but for the planet, uh, the study of the planets. And here I summarized um, what I wanted my first book to be. Uh, so explain why science is useful, because as I show you, uh, the girls, especially, they don't see why science is useful. So I thought that if you want to reach women, you have to explain more why science is useful. Um, give an insight of what it looks like to be a scientist, because uh, maybe as uh, some of you, 
uh, when you have kids or teenagers coming to you, they're like, oh, I want to be an astrophysicist. I have my own telescope. And they're like, ah, sorry. <laughs> As an astrophysicist, we never work with a telescope. <laughs> they are only in Chile, uh, in the desert. So uh, you have to work with a computer and maps. So it's a little bit different. Uh, be enthusiastic because I'm a, I'm a teacher at university. So I see that the young generation of students are very, very depressed <laughs> in the state of the world right now. So we need to show them that science is actually uh, can bring some answers about being positive about the future. Uh, promote past and present world models with diversity. And this I learned uh, from many occasions like this one, but when you actually want to promote women, to promote women, usually you also promote all other underrepresented people in the, the academia. So it's a, a good way to, to present science made by everyone. Uh, don't pretend to know it all because I'm only uh, 31 years old and at the very beginning of my career. So uh, I want to stay very uh, honest about the fact that it's not a... For example, I didn't want my book to be called uh, an introduction to uh, the map and make 300 pages of very difficult stuff. Um, be fun and easy to read, so a few jokes but no equations. Uh, be written in such a way that women and men feel comfortable about it. And this it was also inspired by the rules I learned when I got my permanent position at Southern University. We had a, a training uh, of everything that from grade, grade, giving grades to students to uh, using the tools of the university and so on. But we also had a talk on the rules that Sorbonne University uh, want us to apply for being inclusive. So at Sorbonne University, they don't want us to use, uh, for medium. you see what I mean? Or it's the, <laughs> the point that is in the middle that you can put. Uh, inclusive spelling. Yeah, it's, yeah, but inclusive spelling, you have different way of doing inclusive spelling. And in French, at least one of them is to put a point between the masculine and feminine uh, termination of the word. But at Southern University, we don't have to do that, or they don't want us to do that. They want us to, at the maximum, put the feminine word in its entirety, and then the male version. I don't know if it's very clear. <laughs> But being inclusive in French, so I had the book of Katie Mac under my, uh, so the English version and the French version, and I realized that being inclusive in French, so sorry, there's a spelling mistake, it's being inclusive in French is more difficult than in English because you have the feminine and the male versions of words, but they don't have the same meaning, <laughs> which is very fun. For example, I'm an associate professor. In French, it's called maître de conférence. If I want to make my title in the feminine way, it's maîtresse de conférence. When you write maîtresse in Google, so it's uh, screen uh, captures of yesterday me uh, looking on Google. Um, if you write maîtresse, the first three choices, it's maîtresse d'un homme marié. <laughs> so I don't know if you are very good in French, but it's basically, uh, how do you say maîtresse? Or the mistress. So it's a mistress. Then you have maîtresse de conférence, like I'm happy. And then you have maîtresse de maison, which means uh, taking care of your house. And then if you look at maître, so just maître, uh, on Google, so of course it's a very short uh, search, but I think of a student, for example, who writes maître in uh, Google. If you write maître, it's person qui commence, so people who commence, um, things that direct the behavior of men, uh, or second is person, so people who has such a, a big degree of talent, knowledge that it's uh, that it can be a model for other people. And if you write maîtresse, <laughs> the definition is people who teach at school, uh, or a uh, person which comments to domestic to servants. So, uh, yeah, it's just a stupid example, but uh, I still say I'm maîtresse de conference, but I understand why some people are very shocked, so maybe think I'm 
taking care of the house and the servants at some university. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so it's more difficult because uh, if, you don't, don't, if you translate a word in its feminine version, people have a full set of ideas that are associated with this female version. So we had strong debate with Antoine, my editor, because me, when I write now, <laughs> I'm very biased about this. So there's a rule I really have issues to apply. It's, in French, it's called le masculin l'emporte sur le féminin, which means that in French, if you speak of this group, for example, you have to say il, because there are at least one uh, present in the group. So for example, here, so sorry for the French, but I put a, a paste of this. Uh, it's an extract of the book. So in this sentence, I'm talking about the fact that there are only eight planets, so it's easier to know them individually than stars, because you have billions of stars. And I had written, n'importe quel astrophysicien qui travaillerait sur les étoiles, les galaxies, couldn't say the same. Because me, I was thinking about me and about uh, French and colleagues, and I don't know why they had written the French, the feminine version. But my editor was like, no, it's, if you say that, it really sounds like it's specific to women. So I had to change the yeah, masculine. Sorry. Yeah, we cannot uh, discuss yeah. later. But so in most of the pages of the book, I uh, didn't do that all the time because it was a little bit too heavy. But usually I use uh, neutral words. So for example, scientific in French and planetologue and collègue instead of chercheur or astrophysicien. Of course, when it's uh, accurate, we don't speak of a guy who studies stars by saying it's a planet but uh, I mean, as much as possible, I try to use words that are not either feminine or masculine or that actually sound the same. For example, here, I uh, put an example, I speak about the planet the the system solaire, and then I speak about a Martian, and then in the footnotes, footnotes are about the jokes and the Yes, yeah, for the jokes. But I say that Martian, when you're an astrophysicist, you, you, when people say uh, Martian, it's a, a colleague that works on Mars. So I specific. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's not a Martian from the extraterrestrial guy. But then, I, you see, I try to put Martian et Martienne to, to remind people that they're actually a female uh, astrophysicist to work on Mars. And about role models, I uh, try to, so I, it's a book about planets. I didn't want it to be like planets for women. Or put it uh, the pink cover with uh, a unicorn. Um, but I have a, a specific chapter about uh, women who work on planets. And I explained that it's did on purpose. Because when you, and this is something I learned in Toulouse, is that when you teach physics, just Without doing any history of science, you actually mention men because the units are called by names of men, the theorems, uh, the laws of physics, and everything. So I say, okay, uh, in the first pages of the book, I mention men without you to realize it, just because I had to, to speak about Kepler, Tycho Brahe, and the Géant, <laughs> as uh, Stefano Kuhn uh, said. Um, so now I, I say, okay, uh, I assume I put a specific chapter on uh, the female contribution. And I try to mix past and present uh, role models. And I explain that, for example, me, when I was a very young student in 2012, uh, I was in Oxford and I realized that in Oxford, in the same building, there was a, a woman called Justin Bell, and you, you know about her. She is famous in astrophysics, and I, I had heard about her when I was a student because she discovered the uh, pulsars, and uh, her PhD advisors got the Nobel Prize for it. So I sent her an email, and she received the, the trainees at the time. And what is very fun is that on this picture, the three women we are still professional astrophysicists uh, now. <laughs> And the man left astrophysics, and he's, he did a PhD in physics, but he, he left astrophysics. But I think we, all of three, so Maya on the right and Boini on the left, we, we still remember this, uh, this meeting with Justin Bell, because it was very important to us. 
And now I show you just an example, so it's not about the book, but when I teach planetology at Sorbonne University, I do the same. I have uh, two slides at the end where I promote uh, current uh, women who play an active role in uh, the exploration of the solar system. So sorry, it's in French, but it's really like the slides from my class. And I also promote, promote uh, for example, former intern, my former intern, uh, Emma, who is a young uh, graduate trainee at Lisa at the Space Agency, or Ines, who is a postdoc in uh, GPS, so the lab of NASA, who designed most of the missions to, to the planet. To, to be sure, I don't only speak of uh, women who have a super CV and uh, uh, teenager or young students of 20 year old, they don't uh, actually, uh, of course, they need people with huge CV to, to, to have a, an idea of where they could go, but they also need models of people who are more close to them. And then, so I'm very quick, I don't, I lost the track of time with the issue, but um, also I wanted so to give an insight of what it looks like to be an astrophysicist, and there I totally assumed to be a, a woman, and I uh, did a, a page of the diary of Bridget Jones, if Bridget Jones was a plasma physicist. And still there, for example, so I, from French speaking people here, I try to remain as gender neutral as possible. So for example, there is colleague number two. It's very fun when you maybe just read this paragraph to people. If you ask them if colleague number two is a woman or a man, it's very uh, <laughs> different from people <laughs> because it's very usually. Uh, and uh, for example, in this uh, diary, I uh, specifically uh, mentioned, for example, that I work with a woman in Ireland or that I have a female uh, trainee, these kind of things. I uh, follow also the example of advice of a, a woman, a part of Femme Science, and uh, she gave a talk just before I, I wrote the book, so I, I still had, had uh, this in mind. So Marie Blanche Moura, in uh, the colloquium uh, of Femme Science, she said that if you want to, to attract women to science, you need to promote uh, things that are not maths and physics. Of course, you need to promote maths and physics, but you need to say that uh, being a researcher and being a scientist, it's not only being good at maths, and you need also a, um, oh, a in English, critical yeah. spirit, <laughs> creativity, uh, listening, uh, humility, and uh, that, that is very important. And it's not by reading about a book called uh, Sur les épaules des géants that you think that doubt is part of being a researcher. And uh, so that's why I wrote the last book, the, the last chapter of the book, I called it uh, How to be a, a Sherlock Holmes of the Planet. And, um, and I explained that you need a lot of quality. And for example, I also quoted, uh, I, I tried to quote, for example, songs, famous songs that are. Uh, Song by men and women, for example. Uh, so that's uh, the part about uh, having a good uh, musical playlist to help you uh, stand for the competition. Um, yeah. And I finished by uh, trying to, to promote, and I do this a lot in all my talks and board games of Solar Arbiter also, to promote the human side of science. That's saying that if you, if you are very good in math and physics, but you hate people, you, you won't manage your career, I'd say, in the last today. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago it was the case, but today if you, if you scream at the administrative lady who is supposed to sign the convention stage, you will not go very far. So <laughs> I just say that you need to actually uh, like people to do these kind of jobs because it's uh, made by people, so it's uh, very important. And so that's my conclusion is that uh, I really don't regret to have spent most of my maternity leave uh, on this <laughs> with a baby. My baby was living in my school, so I, I, could, uh, I could write a lot during the, the max of the, the baby. Um, but uh, I really don't regret because um, I, mean, I don't think people read the book, <laughs> to be honest. But um, it actually gave me a very good impact in the media, and I think that's also what is from the talk, the previous talk about the opening of this museum here, yeah. is that when you have a good media coverage, uh, then you reach people that you would never reach otherwise, 
For example, there was this video by Combini, I don't know if you know Combini, it's a French media that is essentially online and it's very uh, attended by young people. And they made a short video where I don't speak of the book at all. Um, and the video was seen a lot on TikTok where I usually don't go. <laughs> so, um, and it was fun, the comments were very fun uh, on TikTok and uh, they were yeah, very about uh, explaining stuff. So I wanted to take the occasion to thank uh, the people like Panto, so Sylvain and the May who trusted me with the project. To Antoine, who, who had a lot of debates with me about how you speak about science in a gender neutral way. And to Marion, because she's the, the press agent and she did a very good work as a, talking to different media. So, yeah, they're all part of the, of the projects. But, and thank you all. Okay, so I'm going to give the questions part. So we have questions from the, from the audience. Ah, okay. okay. So we can have questions from the audience. And again, the rule is that if there is a question, one of us has to repeat it so we should get broadcasted. And also, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, Carol is also going to have questions from us from the, from the audience. Or not. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so maybe I, I start with the question uh, to Lea. Of course, I mean, there was only start about the French grammar, but I was kind of very surprised that they, they forced you to, to, to switch to, to correct French grammar, because now there are a lot of books which are not written with this word. Like it shocked me also when I was in primary school and they told us, I mean, I, I was told that if there are 15 people in a room and one guy, the masculine is always uh, overcoming the feminine. But now it's really kind of accepted that uh, I know several books where there is a ma vast majority of women, then we, we, write, in, uh, we write in the feminine. Uh, so I'm just... Yeah. Kind of shocked that it was uh, really uh, something you had to do. Yeah, so so as I said, it was uh, really, uh, I mean, if you read the books, the book usually I say, uh, les chercheuses, les chercheurs, les étudiantes et les étudiants, most of the time. So it's just that I also listen to the comments from Antoine that uh, it really depends on the message you want to, to share. And me, I really didn't want this to be a women book, like women only book, and maybe it's a mistake. <laughs> but um, and uh, so I also understood the comment that uh, you have to to make a you have to you don't have to. But it can be uh, interesting to also uh, know about uh, to understand that even if we here are all used to. Now, inclusive writing, and it doesn't shock us at all. If you want to reach a very wide audience, you have to, to mix uh, also the, I don't know how to say this, so simply in English, but it's just that I, so I was not forced to. I think if I had really insisted, they, they would have let okay. me uh, put uh, the film version. It's just that I also listened to the advice that uh, it would maybe have uh, misdirected the message if I had written everything. Female version, and it's to be, and to be really honest, you saw the, the graphics at the beginning, it's true that we are only 24% of women, so um, it's not even that we are, for example, 50 50, so it's still also, if you, if you write everything as if women were everywhere, you can also carry the wrong message that there are enough women and we don't need, a, or there are too many women, so it should be even worse. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, I made some choices about that. Okay. Okay, so Carl, do you have any questions from, from the from the Zoom? We have none from Zoom, but I have questions. Okay, so please go. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you. I have a question on the museum. Um, when you made the decision to bring more women more prominently shown in, in the museum, 
what kind of resistance did you get or did you get any? And, and how did you respond? Actually, in some sense, we had no resistance because the groups where we were working, we were trying to do something. I mean, people were were uh, interested in these gender issues and they wanted to show women. But the question was 20%, 30%, uh, 3 over 10, or things like that. And then at some point, when uh, she, she came to me and said, I said, okay, it could be 50%. And at the beginning, you say, why? And then, okay. 50%. It's, it, it was solving a problem, so you know, sometimes it's better to have a solution to have a problem. <laughs> so 50%. So, okay, but uh, we had a very, very special, I mean, people who were working for, wanted to work, work for the museum. I mean, they wanted to give, they were giving time and energy for this project. And it was something that they were doing. Uh, after their own activities, you know, and so you know, they just agree, but it's not easy. But for the moment, I don't know whether we have a criticism of that response. Yeah. So, more questions? Okay. So, talk? Yes? Maybe you, you Maybe shout the question and we'll repeat it. We'll repeat. I was very interested in the way you presenting the language French, which I don't speak French, um, on the different how to address women in positions and men. <coughs> in English, it's less of a problem. Many of the titles are non uh, gender based. But for instance, when you talk about actors in England, um, they used to be actor and actress. And now they all call themselves actors. Is there any movement in the French society towards that? No, but it's 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 so the question is uh, that, for example, even in English-speaking uh, countries, which uh, there are mutual worlds most of the time, there were a uh, difference between, for example, male actors and female actresses. Yes. And now there's a movement that everyone is called an actor, even if it's a, a woman. Um, so since I regularly have questions for people asking me why I call myself maîtresse de conférence, uh, a lot from colleagues from academia say that it's not good because it's by doing this I'm underestimating myself because as I showed you it's a maître de maison, maîtresse de maison, or maîtresse d'école. Uh, and the very fun part is that I had a discussion with this at my former music school. So there were like 99% of women teaching in the music school. And when I told, told her, my former music teacher, I was a maîtresse de conférence, she, said, she first thought I was teaching to kids. Really, like, uh, and after a few discussions, she said, oh, but you're teaching at university, but why are you a maître de conférence? Um, <laughs> and it was very fun because, and she said to me, I want to be called a professor, and not with the E in the end, a professor de musique. And it was very fun to discuss with her because I told her, of course, you, you do that, but you are in a school where 99% of your colleagues are, are women. You don't need to fight to show that you are a professional because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. And I think there are very nice videos on YouTube about this and studies that show that if you read a, 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 a text written and you say les acteurs uh, du film uh, were very good, if you ask then people, if the group of people represented men and women or both, usually people think it was only men. So knowing this, <laughs> and now that I have a permanent position, and maybe I won't be promoted at academic science or whatever, but I don't, I don't know. I feel that I don't see the, I feel the very big question when I want to write a book is says, what risk did I take as a young researcher by writing a book with a feminist uh, <laughs> connotation, because uh, 
uh, yeah, when you are 13 years old, you, you still think about uh, the fact that you, you have colleagues that can be uh, not as nice and positive as you, you are. <laughs> so, but this is really, uh, and so I don't think there's a movement, but I think there are still a lot of uh, ideology and fighting about this. And Académie Française didn't help at all because they actually said that uh, using feminine version of words were bad. I mean, I think they said that a few years ago, actually. So I know it's still a debate, and I think it's still very uh, anchored in the social uh, milieu where you evolve. So, but I don't think there's an official movement for the conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I would like to thank you both for these talks about languages. I think that uh, every language will have a repository, a wonderful repository of uh, you know places where you can find that. I want to ask everyone here. Lots of us have master's degrees. Nobody here has a mistress degree, right? <laughs> so just look, keep looking, you will find them. Um, and um, I, I think that, in fact, both of you have, so I, I, really, I will speak now as a historian of science. I think that both of you have- You have to make that book. Yes, so I would speak here as a historian of science. I think that, yeah, if you want to display history as told, if you want to look at the list of uh, Nobel Prize winners, that's a, you know, historical fact, you're not going to find women and you have to be, make an effort to look for them. And actually, Lea mentioned that units, um, physical units are all names of men. I want to say Curie is a man's name and Marie Curie's name is her husband's name, right? Nobody knows that she was Swodowska except maybe, um, you know, European uh, uh, people who promote some exchange programs, but so, there, there is an issue there, and I think there is, first you have to distinguish between reality and representation. There is an issue of visibility, and um, in, a, in a sense, you do not need to put Poincaré and other great men in the whole of that museum, because everybody knows them already, right? Everybody who's interested in mathematics. And I think it's, the, 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 the point is, if you're thinking about the future, the important thing is to say, you know, mathematics or astrophysics or any uh, scientific discipline is for all, uh, whatever your gender, whatever the color of your skin, your social background. Societies do not always make that possible, but scientists who work on popularization should really, I think it's a priority message over listing the great people whose name has been repeated for so long in history. So a question came from online, um, and they said, please share some ideas on how to incorporate gender equality in the making of science instructional materials. And thank you very much for the talk. So I gave a webinar about this like a week ago. It's <laughs> <laughs> <So, laughs> <sorry, laughs> It's online, it's in French, I'm sorry, but I think that's the issue of uh, speaking about gender equality when teaching is that as long as teaching is done in everyone's country's language, it's difficult to give tips that are universal. But it's not, I was thinking about this because, for example, when you look at the numbers in Spain, in Spain there are more than 50% of women engineers, and I'm not Spanish speaking at all, but I think they have also feminine and masculine yeah. version of yeah. world. So, just to show you that it's not a, <laughs> you know, a, 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 a curse, <laughs> but we can, uh, we can say this. And that's why also, I think the, the important thing is to actually promote that we need everyone and we need everything. <laughs> I mean, we need museums, we need books, we need conferences. If you just put all your efforts on books, that you will miss a lot of people because there are a lot of people who don't read books. If you, if you just so that's why uh, it's I think what can be done at the level of the of the committee, for example, is to to actually uh, promote this uh, a lot 
more uh, when you speak to institutions and uh, like research institu institutes, for example, and uh, that uh, outreach is very part of the missions of researchers. And even if you're not good at outreach, uh, there is always a form of outreach that you can actually do because there are several forms of outreach. For example, in astrophysics, they are looking for people to define the French words to describe physics at academic institutes. And uh, I was asked to be part of this group, but I had no time to do that, and so I had to decline. But I was really, I have a lot of colleagues who are not very at ease, for example, to speak in public, but they could be very good at this mission, and they don't think about this because it's not recognized uh, uh, when you apply for funding or stuff like that. But uh, there are many ways and many things to, to be done. So uh, maybe the tip is to actually be sure you include uh, all of your colleagues when you, you organize the uh, science stuff. Me, yeah, I was very. I found something funny when you spoke about the history of the museum, is that when you look at the outreach world, when uh, you started to share it, uh, the number of men and women in the group uh, changed. I was wondering if it was like a pure uh, no, no, no. coincidence or if it was uh, maybe uh, biased by your colleagues like you do outreach because you're a woman or something like that. So the point is that we have decided to have as many men and women. But, uh, okay. The first issue was 50 50, and now, yes, it's a bit, it's a bit biased, yeah. <laughs> but uh, maybe it was, that was, um, we, we try not to find as many women and men, but people who are really interested in, uh, in the visa outreach issues and that would do some job. <laughs> okay. And so we have our own. But just for what has to be done, uh, in my opinion, I think this your committee is very important to the pressure of institutions. Because what I can see in France, for example, is that if you look to the uh, firm, private firms which are working in numerics, for example, they have been asked to improve their, their, their ratio of women. And they have uh, some firms are really working hard for sensibilizing people to, to, to be as effect. How to, as you say, how to have some inclusive way of speaking to people, how to include women, how to promote women, and this is something that the state institutions are not is not doing. And for example, I was saying that our, um, so I think that they would need pressure to 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 be fair with uh, in the career in the women in the women's careers. And for example, if you look to the so articles that we have got after the opening of the museum, most of them they were showing more or less as many women and men. I mean, it, that, that appears naturally, except two journals. Le Figaro, who told only on Cedric Villani, because he was a political man, and Le Journal du CNRS. So Le Journal du CNRS, I mean, that is very surprising because it's an institution and we could have talked about women, but they have taken a very corporate vision, so they have a corporate vision, so they have picked people who were, are, uh, were paid by the CNRS and they have promoted these persons, and they were men. Okay, so at the end, the journal was, I mean, was, uh, who could have been more uh, fairer has made an issue and forgotten that the head of the institute was a woman and that many people who have worked in the, in the, in the, in the exhibition were men. The person they have promoted, I was very happy that they were promoted, you know, because they were nice colleagues who have helped us a lot, and they were scientists in the Senate, and that was okay. But in some sense, we could have added someone. Yeah, this is something which is interesting that sometimes the institutions are the worst in the world, and private companies are making more work, more job. For example, there is something that I learned. So I got once a very very, I mean, um. um how to say mythology? Some yeah. language yeah. was, uh, yeah. yeah. was very bad. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I show it to someone who was working in a bank, and this person told me, in my bank, best, you would never have got this mail because the words were, that were used would have been, if there would be some alarm, siren, I don't know, that would have prevented yeah. me to get the email. The email would have been suppressed. This is something that we don't have at university, and these shitty mails, you get them anyhow. 
And this is something that I think the institutions have to think about it, whether they really want to do equality or whether we just want to advertise that we are doing things and making fuss about it, but not doing the basic things of the And the basic things are very simple, just prevent this sort of uh, aggressive email policy. Uh, just I was thinking about the tips, something you can do for uh, teaching is, for example, when you have uh, something I try to do now and it works, I don't know if it's a chance or not. I'm not a teacher for very long, so I don't have a lot of fears to make statistics. But um, when I have a, promote a, a, a class, uh, you know, in French, at least, they have the pre-skills, uh, pre uh, what you need to attend the class. And I always try to say a good level of maths, physics, but I also had, I want curiosity, I want uh, people who want working as a team, I want, so I try to put other skills, so I don't say I want women, <laughs> but I say uh, this, and I noticed that when I do that, so I, I, what I don't know is that if it works because I'm also a woman proposing the class, this I cannot test. So I need to ask my male colleagues to do that also to see if it works. <laughs> but um, but if you if you actually explain that you're not looking at uh, and something we learned at the last colloque of Amazon is that also you don't need you shouldn't say for example the word uh, talent or genius or whatever that make it sound that you should be like born a math mathematician guy <laughs> that you are genetically a program to, to be a Nobel Prize in mathematics. So if you do an effort while promoting the class, uh, explaining what the point is, you you are more uh, uh, open to students that are not uh, male uh, white guys uh, from the fifth arrondissement of Paris. I say that because it's teaching in English. So. <laughs> it's in the middle of the fifth arrondissement. But uh, yeah, so I think it's something that is easy to do, to, do, uh, to think about this. And, uh, and also cl clarify this when you, you grade students to make a very precise read of what the grade will be about and explicitly mention that, for example, uh, working as a team will be part of the grade and mention it uh, very clearly. I think it's also nice. That's a question. So another question from online. Uh, what would you recommend to men willing to popularize science without gender bias? How can they contribute and what should they be careful of? Thank you. <laughs> maybe something for, for people who are feminine and masculine. And this is something in good Emilie Coupin is a medal, fifth medalist, he told me. Always say les étudiantes et les étudiants, les, les mathématiciennes et les mathématiciens, les physiciennes et les physiciens. Uh, what he says is that he's doing this, he has started to do it systematically when he was in the media. And, uh, and that was, I mean, the, the persons were, he got a lot of people saying, thank you for saying les mathématiciennes et les mathématiciens. And this, I think, is already in French, it's crucial. Just to say that, I mean, everybody is. Uh, and then I think the idea of saying I am speaking of a, a woman, of a, of a man, a scientist, I speak also to, of a woman. This is not very difficult because usually there is, you can find someone, you have to look a little bit, to look on the web, to find someone. But if you decide when you promote a big guy <laughs> to promote also a big lady, <laughs> I think this is enough. You just uh, you just offer two visions, two type of persons, and this opens this open doors. In fact, also I'm going to feel it's a bit sarcastic, but uh, train yourself, <laughs> learn stuff, <laughs> learn about famous women or not famous women, and also don't ask a female colleague to speak about gender issues <laughs> at the next meeting because I me mean, yeah, I I will sound a little bit. Uh, pretentious of saying this, but now I want to do science, you know, I have a permanent position as a physicist. And I'm very bored because I took a lot of time with other women and some men, I have to say, but with a lot of female colleagues, we took time to write biographies of famous astronomers on the website of the Observatory of Paris, we did things for famous science, we did things for a lot of things. 
And I still have colleagues, many colleagues who ask me as if it was an honor, you know, <laughs> oh, we are doing a talk, we want to speak about women, so could you come and speak <laughs> about women? I understand the, the idea is that I'm a woman, so of course uh, it speaks more because I'm a woman. And, uh, but, but I told them, if I don't do science <laughs> in 10 years, I will not promote the good picture because I will say that, okay, I'm a woman, but I only speak about women in science and I don't do science. So now I told my colleagues, we have put all these biographies online, that's why I did the seminar online uh, last week, just basically to give them a list of many things that they can uh, know about, so that they train themselves and that they actually uh, promote. Uh, but what is fun, and something I found, so sorry for the many in the room, I, I, when I speak like this, I really remember the movie, the Disney movie, uh, Mary Poppins, where the mom, she says that the men um, they we like them, but as a group, they can, they can be rather stupid. So <laughs> I'm very sorry because uh, by saying this, I'm saying sexist stuff about men, basically. But um, what I think is that, uh, sorry, I forgot what I want to say. Yeah, so you, you need to train and to 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 make yourself. Oh, yeah, what I wanted to say is that when you tell male colleagues that they should train themselves on gender equality issues, they actually discover that. The same techniques are the same when you want to promote uh, non-white people, and that's also a way to make men active in the fight. Is that uh, uh, they understand that it's uh, that what we say about role models and stuff. For example, it also sounds for uh, young uh, male researchers who are dead. Now, because <laughs> they face the same issues as we do, like how to manage a baby, uh, uh, taking the baby at the babysitter at six, four o'clock, and uh, manage your science, when how you manage to go to conferences when you have a family to take care of. So when I, I speak to men, I always try to, to show them how much it's a, a, a issue for everyone, and how, as men, they will feel more comfortable to do research when they know about this. and. Uh, for example, it's fun what they do for the Me Too. I don't think if you saw that in the news, but there's a Me Too garçon now. Mm -hmm. Because actors, male actors, also face uh, sexual uh, harassment and violence in the cinema sector. Mm -hmm. And now there's a hashtag Me Too garçon. So it's, it's really like the proof <laughs> that when you fight for women, you actually fight for everybody. Yeah. And I think it's a nice thing to, to say to male colleagues so that they. Well, but also something I discovered by reading a book from my publisher, because they sent me some books, uh, <laughs> is that there are bias, like, when you think the brain is working from uh, evolution, when we have a, a, a bad news, it takes at least five good news to cover the bad news, in terms of, our brain is more attracted to bad news. And I think it's very true for sexy stuff. Even if you have, Five super nice male colleagues who promote you, give you insights, or write your recommendation letters. It's enough to have one <laughs> male colleague who says, uh, Oh, uh, uh, I know you can't do that because you're a mom. Yeah. You have a lot of. <laughs> you, you, you want my life to take this project <laughs> because you have a baby. And the guy is nice, you know, by saying this. He wants to help me. Yeah, yeah. You're a poor little. Yeah. <laughs> so it's enough to have one male colleague doing that, but as a woman, it's. You, you think about it all the time in the bus, like, oh, this guy told me this, and it's not nice. And so, yeah, be nice. <laughs> uh, and think that even if you're nice, and if, as a man, you're doing the right things, uh, you have a good, very good, strong mission to do, because it's enough that only one male colleague is doing bad stuff that people really remember that. So, yeah, it's even more important for men, I think, to take the fight now. You have a huge responsibility. Sorry for taking too much time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, I just wanted to, to come back to what Lucie was saying about the institution being very bad. So this is something really we've seen when we did this survey, the gender data science project, that uh, in companies uh, it's really better. I mean, the gender gap is smaller and people take more care. And it's really the worst is between students and at the university inside the, our institutions. So it's really something we have to keep in mind. But the firms did it because they were obliged. 
know. Yeah, and, so, people, <laughs> and also point. something, because yeah, at the last uh, meeting of Family Science, I discussed with uh, women who were government researchers at CNRS and quit because of sexual harassment and went to work at a private company. And I asked her, I said, but are men more you know, sexist in private companies or less sexist in Israel, like when you're private? Uh, and she told me, no, the men are the same, and it's not uh, <laughs> because you are paid by a private company, but you are much uh, more feminist. But what she said, and I think a lot about it since then, is that in private companies, you actually have people on um, human resources, and you have compulsory training. <laughs> and in academia, as an institution, most of the time, the training, like government training, is not compulsory. So as a permanent researcher, you, you are never forced to follow uh, training. So I thought about this, and I don't say that like, we should oblige all researchers to follow training, but I think that's also uh, one of the big differences that, of course, there's a law, and as you said, it's very important because it makes me change much faster. But they have actually human resources, and I was thinking about this because, for example, at the scale of uh, unions, maybe, I don't know, but it could be nice to negotiate uh, money to actually have people doing all these studies, all these trainings, and proposing, I think it's already the case a little bit since the last few years, but to propose online courses and things like that, because you have to think that the lab, to never have the money to pay uh, someone to in a class about uh, gender equality issues, for example. So yeah. it could be the role of the unions and the community to make sure that there are enough uh, trainings on this question by, made by socialists, psychologists, like not researcher guys who <laughs> do this on the weekends, but uh, to, to have this. Uh, the point is that the big firms, they have been saying that it's I don't remember exactly when they will have to have a certain percentage of women in their boards, so at the top. But to get your, this percentage of the board, they realized that they have to, to prepare persons. And that they, they started to, to try to promote women at any level. And then they did this uh, training, compulsory training for the managers, so that they are able to find the women that would be promoted and to help them to, to do the things that has to be done for being promoted. So this is really a mixture of this obligation at the top has had repercussions in the sense that they have had to, 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 to work and to, this, to do this from the sort of method. And really, sometimes I would like that my colleagues have some, <laughs> some compulsory training <laughs> about VS yes, because they just say something, sometimes some crazy things. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, are there any more questions? Yes. Can I start? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you both for the great presentation. Uh, I wanted to say, you mentioned that uh, uh, women don't stay in STEM because of imposter syndrome. So, uh, why is it, why is it uh, more uh, common for female researchers and are there any tricks how to even prevent them to stop death? So, uh, the question was that I mentioned the imposter syndrome. So the fact that uh, I, for example, I would personally feel not at my place to speak in front of you now because I won't be qualified enough for this kind of things. And the question was, uh, why is it more specific to women than men in academia? Um, so I think imposter syndrome is true for a lot of people, not only <laughs> women. And you have, a, I don't know how you call it, the opposite syndrome <laughs> of uh, over promoting yourself or something not uh, very <laughs> interesting. But uh, yeah, so it's not uh, something uh, incurred in your genes because you're women or men. But it's, I think it's totally, I mean, I'm not a socialist, but a sociologist. Uh, that's a shame. <laughs> um, I was about to say it's. Um, I think it's linked to the role, to the lack of role models, because um, and I think there was a. I forgot his name, but a French uh, man mathematician who said that very clearly on France Culture. He said, uh, as a French uh, white uh, man. It, uh, I never thought maths were not for me because I see mm, unconsciously I see uh, male uh, white uh, guys uh, in maths all the time in the media. And, uh, 
everywhere at the head of uh, the same head, at the head of uh, institute, blah, blah. So um, the imposter syndrome, I think some, something to fight and um, to, to fight this is, uh, for example, the mentoring programs. Uh, because as uh, me, even me, when I was uh, hired at Sorbonne University, I had to to, to design a professor at the university, so someone at the next level of career, um, to to help me uh, take my marks at the university. And uh, so I designed a, a, professor, a woman professor. And for example, she was the one to tell me that at Central University, they have a specific program for your months to have a, a, an extra semester of non-teaching after, uh, after the compulsory maternity leave. For example, if she had not been there, I would never have uh, had the information. So I think that the mentoring program is nice because it's, it means you have someone who you trust and you can, you can ask uh, with uh, no issues about how, uh, 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 pretentious, uh, how if it's too pretentious or if it's not aimed at me to go there. So you have someone to, to actually uh, help you sort out, yes, uh, you can go there or yes, you should do that. Or, uh, no, it's not uh, an issue if you go to this committee because uh, they are looking for people uh, with your profile or something like that. So the mentoring programs started, uh, uh, there are several in France now at different universities and uh, I think it's it's doing very well. And uh, now you have even many students who <laughs> apply to mentoring programs, so it's, uh, as I said, a benefit uh, to everyone. Um, and I think also, uh, for example, me, I was asked to be part of the board. And uh, the first thing I told the, the, the guy was, do you think I am old enough, skilled enough to be part of this board? <laughs> and the guy told me, yeah, if you were a man, you would have asked me, why didn't you think about me earlier? <laughs> and I don't know if it's really true. I mean, I'm not a man. I don't know how many you feel about being design and experiences. But since then, I, I laughed to myself <laughs> all the time, thinking that, okay, uh, okay maybe uh, it's uh, not uh, a question of being skilled enough. It's, but it's, it's, I think it's with experience that you, you can face that, but mentoring program can help make it, uh, I mean, uh, avoid uh, to have to wait uh, 20 years of careers to feel it easy. But also, it's an imposter syndrome you have to, to all, uh, at all stages of careers. I think it's uh, also maybe because women, when we do something, we, we, we need to do it right because we have always the feeling that if we don't do it right, we will uh, represent all women in the world. And people will say, oh, we put a woman in this world, but she, she didn't do well. So that means that we. <laughs> we shouldn't trust women, <laughs> not the agriculture, but all the women in the world, because the agriculture say that. So, also, maybe we have this bigger responsibility. And uh, so, maybe, for example, we should uh, promote that men, when they don't know nothing in the board, they should be out. Yeah. Then we have no one in the board anymore, <laughs> maybe. Then. Yeah, so it's something to, to maybe promote that if you're not active in a group, you just quit and it's not a big deal, but uh, you, don't, you don't are in the committee if you don't take part uh, in the programs because otherwise it's uh, worse for the women part in the board or for any active people in the board. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was a very interesting question. So, is that, is still one question? Okay. Yes, the, the last question. Um, maybe it's a little bit linked to my project about uh, trying to imagine a museum for women rights in Paris. But, uh, yeah. You mentioned the like, written about the fact that when you were a kid, and you follow your parents and you see a lot of museums. I'm a little scientist, I have a little company in British Arts. I'm having three kids. I brought them to a lot of museums, like Immigration Museum in Paris, which is wonderful. And there's some other you can say something is missing is really about, I would say, a museum for women rights. And because it's a long-term project, of course, we'll have 
when future kids are about kids, but this is something really important. All those stories you bring, um, you know, like in my era, you know, it's in pharma and in biosocial structure, you know, was I inventing who discovers the global uh, DNA healthy structure, you know, she is that she hasn't got this Nobel Prize, you know, that's a what's an encrypt, but um, so but it's not why it's a shame so well. So just your comment about such idea I'm trying to push <laughs> uh, what I call city of um, uh, a city of the world, city of human rights. Sorry. Maybe you know it, there is a project in Angers. Yes, I know, but Angers, it's yeah. a bit far, Angers. You know, when you are very mm -hmm. super, go to Angers, but you're right. Right. I always think to do and I think we should really be uh, careful about the Paris on the yeah. uh, because I mean, in Toulouse we had super nice things. There's uh, the museum, uh, for example, at Toulouse it's a museum of science, but uh, they are super strongly involved in all gender equality issues. And also, I don't uh, want to discourage you from our project, but um, I think also it's important not to separate women from men. For example, I don't know if you heard about this, but I. Uh, Review the project for application to common position at CNRS for the male uh, former friends, a student at university, and he has seen my advice. And he had written in his common researcher application that because he wanted to promote female scientists, he wanted to promote uh, women only conferences. And uh, me, it was like, uh, why are you doing that? <laughs> we are only 24% of researchers. If you only accept women in the audience, you, my science will be only known by 24% of people. And say, yeah, but you know, women, they have to face attacks by men, so they feel more comfortable in the women on the environment. And I, so I didn't discuss too much with this guy in particular, but I it really ring the bell that we have to be very careful because it's, that is <laughs> from uh, you know uh, saying that uh, we uh, poor women need a specific uh, lab, a specific uh, funding agency, a specific uh, blah blah, and we have I think to be very careful of what we fight for, and sometimes uh, yeah we we have to be very careful. <laughs> I don't say it's not a bad good idea. It's just it's nice to actually make sure that all science museums are. Where and make uh, gender, uh, uh, not gender bias uh, exhibitions and uh, promote women, for example. But I'm not sure that uh, specific, and also something you can do is like online uh, exhibitions that people can download for free, so it doesn't bring you any money. But this is very useful because, for example, the CNRS and Fabrice, they did a feature called an exhibition called XXA uh, to promote uh, female researchers. And what is nice with this exhibition is that it's easy to download and to print. So if you have a high school project, if you have a museum project, you can actually download the exhibition and print it and put it in the corridors of the school. So this is also something that is a very useful, I think, yeah. exhibitions that are available online. Yeah. OK, so I think we, we have more time uh, with everybody yeah. because we have lunch, but we need, we need to go on with the uh, next step of the program. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.